Okay, so then just to remind you about alternating series, there was the alternating series test. Right, alternating series test, which is where if you are given a series, the sum from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n or negative 1 to the n plus 1 multiplied by a n where a n is positive, then, or really if, 1, what are the two requirements to show that an alternating series converges? The limit, right? The limit of what? Of a n has to be what? 0, good. Okay, and what else has to be true about a n? Monotone decreasing. Monotone decreasing, which is to say that a n plus 1 is less than or equal to a n. So if the limit is 0, the limit of the sequence part is 0, and the sequence part is monotone decreasing, then the alternating series, 1 to infinity, negative 1 to the n, a n, converges. Okay, that's the alternating series test. <coughs> okay, another thing is that we said given given a n right, if the sum from n is 1 to infinity of the absolute value of a n converges, then two things. One, the sum from n is 1 to infinity of a n converges. <coughs> okay, so if the sum of the absolute values converges, then the original series converges. But more than that, it is said to converge what? Absolutely. Absolutely. So then the second thing was that, well, if the series converges, but not absolutely, then we have some new jargon. The series converges how? Conditionally. Good. So, you know, there's going to be questions you're going to be asked that say, determine whether or not the series converges absolutely, conditionally, or it diverges. So what should you always check first? Absolute convergence. You should test absolute convergence because if it converges absolutely, then you don't have to do anything else. Okay, probably the second thing you should, t you should try is the nth term test for divergence, or maybe even that should be the first thing you try, because if the nth term test for divergence succeeds, meaning that you have successfully shown that it diverges, then you don't need to test anything else. Okay, so the only time that you need to go on and check if it converges conditionally is if you found that it does not converge absolutely and it does not diverge by the nth term test for divergence, so then finally it may happen that it converges conditionally. So almost in almost every case, I can probably say in every case in this class, if something converges conditionally, it will, it will be because it did not converge absolutely, but does converge with the alternating series test. Okay, so any question about those things? <coughs> Just trying to bring it, bring it all back to you. Okay, good. So now we're in section 9.6. which is called the ratio test and the root test. So again, what we're going to do is we're going to learn about a new kind of series, a new category of series. And you're, by the end of today, we're gonna, you're going to be able to say, oh, I recognize that kind, and I know that I'm supposed to use the root test. Okay. So here, it, or the ratio test, wh whatever the case may be. So here is the ratio test. The ratio test. <coughs> so given 
a sequence a n and a n is not zero right so then a n could have positive terms it could have negative terms but a n is not zero eventually which means that well maybe in the first million or so terms it has some zeros or maybe it's all zero but after that it's never zero anymore <coughs> okay so then one <coughs> we're going to define we're going to define l equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n plus 1 over a n. Okay. <coughs> so, the test requires that this limit exists. If this limit exists, then does not exist, then nothing can be concluded. Right. So then, if L does not exist, then you can't use this test. So, assuming that you can compute the limit, that the limit exists, then we have the following uh, remarks. So, first off, L has to be, assuming L exists, what is the smallest L could possibly be? Zero, right? Because we're computing the limit of positive terms, right? So the smallest it could possibly possibly be is zero. So that's just by th its definition. So then one, <coughs> if if zero is less than or equal to L is less than one. Okay, then the sum from n is 1 to infinity of a n converges but more than converges it converges absolutely okay two if l is strictly greater than 1 then the sum from n is 1 to infinity of a n diverges. <coughs> and 3, what is the last possibility for L? If it's exactly 1. So if it's between 0 and 1, it converges absolutely. If it's greater than 1, it diverges. If L is exactly 1, then there is no conclusion. Okay, so why is this called the ratio test? Because of this ratio right here. <laughs> it's called the ratio. It's called the ratio <coughs> test because of that ratio. So then now tell me, what series have we dealt with, and sequence for that matter, where it was very important to consider that ratio? I had a very special case. Geometric. So what is, what is a geometric sequence? A geometric sequ sequence w w is where something is true about that ratio. It's constant. Right, it's constant. So a sequence is said to be geometric if the ratio of successive terms is a constant. Okay, and then similarly, a a series, a geometric series, is the summation of a geometric sequence. So, what is the condition okay, for a geometric series to converge on the ratio? What's the condition on the ratio? Absolute value is less than 1. Okay, absolute value is less than 1. So, it shouldn't be surprising, right? So, by, by construction, right, this ratio is positive, so we don't need to worry about absolute value because we're, we're putting absolute value right there. Okay, so then what we're saying is that, okay, we're considering this ratio. If the limit of the ratio is less than 1, then it converges, right, just like a geometric series. 
Okay? It doesn't have to be constant, but it has to converge to something that's less than 1. Similarly, if it converges to something which is positive, then just like a geo uh, which is greater than 1, just like a geometric series with ratio greater than 1, it diverges. Okay? And then there's this little gray area right here. What if, what if the limit of the sequence, the limit of the ratio, is exactly 1? Well, then it might converge, it might diverge. The ratio test is not able to make a conclusion. What about the case, what about the case uh, for a geometric series if the ratio is 1? Then what? It diverges. Right? But in that case, that's because a geometric series has a constant ratio 1. Has a constant ratio 1. <coughs> okay, so then let's see why this is the case. So this is now a demonstration of why the previous the ratio test is correct. So assume <coughs> that the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of an plus 1 over an converges to L, <coughs> which is less than 1. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm making two, two assumptions. First, I'm assuming that it converges, because I already said if it doesn't converge, then I have nothing to say. So it converges. Now I'm saying, let's say it converges to something less than 1. Okay, <coughs> then we can do the following. Okay, so by, by the... Uh, it converges to L, which is less than 1. So then by the definition <coughs> of limit, we can find two things. We can find, one, that there is an R, a L less than R less than 1. So we can find an R between L and 1. And two, we can find an n such that a n plus 1 over a n in absolute value is less than r. <coughs> so what am I saying here? So this is a linguistic, a ling linguistic requirements, but this is what I'm saying. So the limit of the sequence converges to l. So then I can find some number between l and 1 such that the sequence, the limit of the, of the ratio, is always less than r from some point on, right? For before, before that point, you know, maybe it takes the first billion terms, it might be greater than r. It might have been greater than r, but after that, it has to eventually be less than r. It can't be any more. Okay, <coughs> so then, we can say the following, that the absolute value of a n plus 1 of a n plus 1 is less than r multiplied by the absolute value of a n. <coughs> okay, and this is for n greater than n. Okay, so then <coughs> we can say, okay, in that case, the absolute value of a n plus 2 must be less than r multiplied by the absolute value of a n plus 1. And all I did was increase the index. But this in turn is less than r multiplied by r multiplied by a n. Right, so what I did is I replaced, <coughs> I replaced this term. Oh, excuse me, not that. I replaced this term with this term. Okay, so then simplifying, right, this is equal to r squared multiplied by a n. So a n plus 2 is less than r squared times a n. <coughs> okay, so then I can continue this pattern and say that, okay, a n plus k is less than r to the k multiplied by a n or n greater than n. <coughs> so then generally speaking, 
I can always say this, that a n is less than, or excuse me, a n plus k is less than r to the k multiplied by the absolute value of a n. And now this n has changed, right? <coughs> and so what's important to see now is that now I have made <coughs> made a this term depend only on k and it no longer depends on depends on the value of the sequence. So I can say this. <coughs> So the sum from n is 1 to infinity of the absolute value of a n, well, that is equal to, I can break this into two sums, the sum from n is 1 to big N of the absolute value of a n. So that's the first part, the first part that could be doing anything whatsoever, right? This part. The sum of the first n terms can be doing anything. But after some time, I can say plus n is big N. So this should be this this top index should be big N minus one. And this should be big N to infinity of the absolute value of a n. <coughs> okay, so then the series the series that's in the red box, tell me about it. Does it converge? The one in the red box. Really, it's not even proper to call it a series. <laughs> Does the sum in the red box converge? So your answer should be immediate and resounding. Yes. <laughs> Why? Why? How many terms are in there? A finite amount, right? Can you add up a finite amount of numbers, a finite quantity? Yeah, you can always add them up. The only thing where there's a question is what about the last, the, what about the, the series in the green box? Does it converge? Does it converge? Well, because of our previous inequalities in arguments, we can say this, that this is less than or equal to the sum from n is 1 to this finite number, n minus 1, the absolute value of a n and then plus now the sum from n is <coughs> n to infinity of the sum of r to the n the absolute value of a big n All right this is from the previous thing <coughs> okay so then now <coughs> Notice that a sub big N, that's just a constant. That's just a constant, so we can say that this is the sum from N is 1 to big N minus 1, the absolute value of a N, plus, I can factor this out, a N multiplied by the sum from N is big N to infinity of R to the N. <coughs> so then now tell me about this. The question is, is does, does this series converge or not? So what kind of series is this? So first off, this is just a constant. Right? This part is just constant. So it doesn't affect the convergence of the series. What kind of series is this? This is geometric. It's a geometric series. What is the condition on big R that says that this will converge? It has to be less than 1 in absolute value. But that's what we said. Right? That's what we said at the very top. So look, it says we can find an R that is greater than L but less than 1. And the rest of the series beyond this point is less than R. And therefore, this series has this property. So then, this series converges. <coughs> this series converges. <coughs> That's right, because if, the se if a sequence converges to, say, half, to one half, then there has to be some place where that sequence from that point on is less than three-fourths. It's never greater than that anymore. 
right? Because that's the epsilon delta definition, right? You have to say that give there's a certain horizontal strip where you can say it's in this horizontal strip from here on. So to say that it converges, that the ratio converges to L, which is less than 1, you can pick any number between L and 1, and there has to be a point where the ratio is always less than that number from then on. <coughs> yes? Okay, okay. So really, so what I mean is that this one, so you know, to make it more clear, I could move it right, this. Oh, what? <laughs> it didn't grab the infinity. Okay. Work with me, machine. So it's like this. Right? This one, this one. Oh, you can't. I'm pointing to the screen. That doesn't help. <laughs> right? These two are equal to each other because I'm saying that this one is the sum of the these first terms plus the rest of the terms. Okay? This this one is equal to this one. These I just copied these. Okay? This one is less than or equal to this one, and these two together are equal to this one. Is that cleared up? Okay. <coughs> Any other questions? So the important thing that I want you to see from this is the ratio test is what it's doing is it set, it set up a comparison between this, this sequence and series that has a ratio that converges less, to less than one. So we said, well, do we know of any other series where we're dealing with ratios and things like that? Sure, a geometric series. So then this sets up a, a comparison using the direct comparison test between a series which might which may not have a constant ratio but has a ratio that converges to something less than 1 to a geometric series which has something that converges less than 1 so the reason why that the ratio test has power and has has the ability to tell you this thing is because of the geometric series okay and for the exact same reason and I'm not going to show it if the ratio converges to something greater than 1, then it has to be greater than a geometric series with ratio greater than 1, and so it diverges as well. Okay, so any question about these things? <coughs> okay, so then mechanically, mechanically all that this comes down to is you use the, you announce to the grader that you're going to use the ratio test, you carefully compute a limit, and if the limit is between 0 and 1, then you say it converges. If it's greater than one, you say it diverges. If it is equal to one, you say, oops, I can't make any conclusion. I need to do something else. So it's good to avoid that because you know doing the ratio test is like half a page or a full page of work. You don't want to you don't want to go through it and say, oh, that was a waste of time. <laughs> okay. <coughs> so for example. the sum from n is 1 to infinity of 2 to the n over n factorial. Okay, so then the first note I'm going to say as a test taking strategy is this. If I say use the ratio test, you should use the ratio test. Okay, second, okay, second, is that if there are factorials, if there are factorials in the problem and it's a series and I want you to determine the convergence or divergence, it is almost certain that you will need to use the ratio test. Right, so then factorial implies ratio test. And this is almost always. And the only reason why I'm why I'm saying almost always is that you know I'm sort of a conservative person. I'd hate to say always, but honestly, I can think of no case where factorial would be there and you would not use the ratio test. <laughs> I can think of none. <coughs> but maybe I'll find one between now and then. Okay, so then, we're going to use the ratio test. So we should announce our intention to the greater. Okay, so let's compute the limit. Okay, so then... <coughs> We're going to use the sequence part a n is 2 to the n over n factorial. 2 to the n over n factorial. So that we need to compute the limit. 
as n goes to infinity of the ratio. Okay, so first off, first off, I kind of want to kind of want to point out. Okay, so two to the n, right? That's geometric. Okay, it grows pretty quick, right? Two to the two to the 128 is like a humongous number. It's almost inconceivably huge number. Okay, but how about uh, in factorial? Factorial grows pretty quick too. So the question is sort of, you know, which one wins? Does one of them win? I don't know. Let's see. So then, if the geometric thing in the numerator, 2 to the n, grows faster than the factorial part in the denominator, will it converge or diverge? No. Will, will, will the series converge or diverge? So what if the geometric part grows, really grows faster than the factor factorial part? Do you think the series will converge? I think it'll diverge because the terms, you'll start accumulating too many big values and then it'll just diverge. Okay, so then it, on the other hand, if the factorial grows much quicker than the geometric part, then the denominator will get really big compared to the numerator and the terms will become really small and maybe you'll be able to add them all up. Okay, so let's try. Okay, so then 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial okay, divided by 2 to the n over n factorial. Right, so then in the limit comparison test, in the limit comparison test, it did not matter which one <coughs> you put in the numerator and which one in the denominator for the limit comparison test. Does it matter for this one? Oh yes, right, it makes all the difference. Okay. So then dividing by this fraction is the same as multiplying by its reciprocal. So this is the limit as n goes to infinity <coughs> of 2 to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial multiplied by n factorial over 2 to the n. And this is, I've dropped the absolute value. Why can I drop the absolute value? All these terms are positive. Okay, so then the limit as n goes to infinity <coughs> of. Now, I will factor 2 to the n plus 1 as 2 to the n multiplied by 2, and then in the numerator, n factorial, and then I'll factor n plus 1 factorial as n plus 1 multiplied by n factorial, and then that 2 to the n is just there. So you can see that the 2 to the n's cancel, the n factorials cancel, <coughs> Altogether, you have an expression that looks like the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 over n plus 1. So what is the limit? 0. Okay, so what category are we in for the, for the ratio test? So does it converge or diverge? Or no conclusion? Converges, right? So then therefore, the sum from n is 1 to infinity of <coughs> 2 to the n over n factorial converges, but it more than converges, it converges absolutely. Okay, so I'd like to point something out here. Okay, I'd like to point something out here. The ratio test, right? We did 2 to the n over n factorial are wondering, how about the limit of the ratio of successive terms? What did it converge to? It converged to zero, right? So, <laughs> so what this is telling you is that n factorial doesn't grow a little bit faster than, ge than the geometric 2 to the n. Not a little bit faster, but in a sense, infinitely faster. And right? it becomes, it, be it gets bigger so much faster than 2 to the n that the ratio of successive terms of, of the given ratio vanishes to zero. Okay, so then, you know, 2 to the 128, that's, a, that's a, just a humongous number. 128 factorial <laughs> is obscene, okay? It's, it's not even polite to talk about it in conversation. <coughs> okay, so any question about this one? <coughs> okay, so then for those of you that are computer science or software engineering majors, this is starting to get related to something that you might already have heard called complexity.
Okay, so then, right, the complexity of n factorial is infinitely greater than the complexity of the geometric term. If, if you're ever writing, if you're ever designing hardware or writing a, p a piece of software and part of the <laughs> part of the complexity has a factorial term in it, you've made a mistake. <laughs> right? you're, you're not doing it correctly, <laughs> almost certainly, <coughs> unless you're in some part of statistics. You're talking about permutations. Okay, so any question about the last example? Any question about it? Okay, so let's do another example. <coughs> let's do another example. So for example, the sum from 1 to infinity of negative 1 to the n multiplied by n, uh, that's the square root of n in the numerator, over n plus 1. Okay, so under normal circumstances, <coughs> under normal circumstances, I would never say let's use the ratio test, but just for the purposes of demonstration, let's use the ratio test. Okay, we're going to use the ratio test with a n is negative 1 to the n, the square root of n over n plus 1. So we're going to compute the limit as n goes to infinity. Incidentally, you know, I said I said under no a normal circumstance on this on this series I wouldn't I wouldn't want you to use the ratio test. Why not? What would you use on this one? Alternating series test. But even before that, you should do what? You should test to see if it converges absolutely. Okay, if it converges absolutely. So if you were to like cover up the alternating term, if you were to cover up the alternating term, then the numerator would be something like n to the one half, or exactly n to the one half. And the denominator, right, what's the most dominant term in the denominator? n. So this kind of behaves like n to the one half over n, which is like one over n to the one half, one over the square root of n. Does that converge or diverge in series? It diverges. It diverges because it, it can, it's comparable to a P series with P is half, so it diverges. Okay, so then this, so you should be able to see from inspection just by making these arguments in your head that, ah, well, this is going to, this is going to diverge. Uh, absolute, uh, it's not going to converge absolutely. <coughs> okay, so then let's see if the ratio test agrees with that assessment. Okay, so then again, I'm instead of dividing by a fraction, I'm going to multiply by its reciprocal. So this will be negative 1 to the n plus 1 multiplied by the square root of n plus 1 over n plus, one, uh, n plus 2. Okay, so that's a n plus 1. And then now I'm going to multiply by 1 over a n. So that will be n plus 1 over <coughs> negative 1 to the n multiplied by the square root of n. And by this, I mean that this is a n plus 1 multiplied by 1 over a n. <coughs> okay, so then now, this is inside of absolute value. So what do I need to do, do to drop the absolute value? All right, so which, which, terms, which terms have, can possibly be negative? Can, can this ever be negative? No, how about this one? No, not that one and that one. Only these two. Right? Only the alternating terms. At any rate, the only things they can ever be are positive one or negative one. So I can just drop the absolute value and the alternating terms, and then it's always positive. OK, so then I'll drop the alternating terms and the absolute value and then rearrange some things. So this will be n, the square root of n plus 1 over the square root of n multiplied by n plus 1 over n plus 2. Okay, maybe one more simplification is warranted. So the square root of n plus 1 over n, like so, combining the square roots, and then n plus 1 over n plus 2. <coughs> okay, so then so then, what is the limit of the square root? 
what is it? 1, right? So the square root of 1, and then multiplied by what is the limit of this ratio? 1. So altogether, what is the limit? 1. Right. So then what is the ratio test able to conclude? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing, right? So the ratio test makes no conclusion. So if this question was, if this question was, consider the following series with the ratio test, right? Then, then this would be the answer, right? If it was just, I just gave you this series and you said, ah, and I want you to determine if it, if it converges, diverges, or conver converges absolutely, converges conditionally, or if it diverges, then if you use the ratio test, you would have wasted your time, right? Because you just did all of this work, the ratio test makes no conclusion, you have to go on and do other things. Okay? <coughs> so any question about this one? Any question about this one? Okay, so finally, <coughs> finally, I want to make a remark, just generally speaking. So then, notice right at the at the beginning of the previous example i said that this right this is comparable to a p series right you should be comfortable with that now because you know if you drop the alternating term and you just consider the numerator and the denominator this is like n to the 1 half the denominator is like n to the 1 so the ratio is like 1 over n to the 1 half which is a p series with p, with p is half so you should be able to see in your head without writing anything down that this behaves like a p-series and not only does it behave like a p-series but I know that that p-series diverges. Okay, so then now the ratio test was not able to tell you anything about this. Okay, and the next remark I'm about to make is going to show you why the, p why the ratio test is not, was not able to say anything about it at all because the ratio test is not able to say anything about any p-series. Right? So then some p-series diverge. For example, the harmonic series is a p-series. It diverges. Okay, but the series of 1 over n squared, well, that converges. And it more than converges, it converges absolutely. Okay, but nevertheless, <coughs> the ratio test is not able to say anything about them. Okay, so this is the ratio test. And p-series. <coughs> Okay, so then, the sum from n is 1 of 1 over n to the p. <coughs> okay, let's use the ratio test. So, what I'm going to say, the conclusion is, is that ratio test cannot make a conclusion. Okay, so then let's use the ratio test. So in this case, we need to compute the limit as n goes to infinity <coughs> of 1 over n plus 1 to the p over <coughs> 1 over n to the p. Okay, and then this inside of absolute value. Of course, I'll just drop the absolute value because all of those terms are positive. So the limit as n goes to infinity, after algebraically rearranging some things, <coughs> right? this will be uh, what? n over n plus 1 to the p Okay, so what is the limit of the term n over n plus 1? That's just 1, so this is 1 to the p, and this works because p is a constant. So it's just 1. So this is for any p-series, right? Some p-series, some p-series diverge, okay? Some p-series converge, absolutely. Okay, but the ratio test is not able to make a conclusion. So what I want, one of the things I want you to see is that, okay, if I'm dealing with a series, like the previous example, where I can see that it's comparable to a p-series, ratio test is out. Don't even try it. It's not going to be able to tell you anything. Furthermore, we're not really going to get into this in this class, but I want you to see that the ratio test, if you determine that something converges with the ratio test, then it really converges. 
Okay, it converges like really fast. Okay, and a geometric series converges really fast. Okay, as in comparison, one over n squared does not really converge nearly as fast as a geometric series or something that something that the ratio test can determine converges. If the ratio test says that this thing converges, then it converges like a geometric series, which is very fast. Okay, <coughs> so any questions about this remark? Yes? Yeah, so recall that <coughs> the P series n is 1 to infinity of 1 over n to the P, right, converges when P is greater than 1. Di diverges in all other cases. <coughs> so like when P is exactly 1, diverges. That's the harmonic series. If P is 1.0000001, it converges. Okay, <coughs> so any question about this? Okay. <coughs> So, now, the root test Okay, so then there's another test that we need to talk about called the root test So let's suppose that we are given a sequence, AN <coughs> Okay, and we're going to define another limit, L is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of a n raised to the 1 over n. Okay, and this, the, the reason why it's called the root test is because we're computing nth roots. <coughs> okay, so then this is, this remark is that right, if L does not exist, then the root test says nothing. Right, so then if, if, we, if you can't actually compute that limit, or if the limit doesn't exist, then th there's no conclusions that can be made. And now, now that we have L, we have the exact same conditions as before. One. If L... So first off, first off, what is the smallest that the limit could possibly be? Zero, right? Because, because we're computing the absolute value and then taking an nth root, okay? So then this couldn't possibly be negative, so this, it has to be greater than or equal to zero. So if zero is less than or equal to L is less than one, then the series from n is one to infinity of a n converges, but it more than converges, it converges absolutely. Okay, second. If L is greater than 1, then the sum from n is 1 to infinity of a n diverges. And <coughs> finally, if L is equal to 1, then the sum from then there is no conclusion. So you can see why these two these two tests are are grouped together in this section, right? Because they both require you to compute a limit and then consider the value of that limit. Right, if the limit, if the value of the limit is between zero and one, it converges. Greater than one, it diverges. Equal to one. No conclusion. Okay, so then the reason, the reasonings why the root tests, I'm not going to go into them because they're just like the ratio test. Okay, what happens here is that if this, if this has this property, then it behaves like a geometric series eventually, right? Maybe at the beginning it's not like a geometric series, but eventually it can, it can be compared to a geometric series. Okay. <coughs> So now, before I get any further, I want to give you a name, just other names for these things. So now, if you have a limit in the ratio test or the root test, okay, that's between 0 and 1, 
then this, this sequence, right, a number that's between 0 and 1 is said to be a contraction, right? Something is contracting. So what if I, what if I take this eraser, say, and I, I shrink its size by half? Right? I, I do an infinite sequence of steps where I shrink it by half. Right? Is, that, is that process going to converge? Yeah, it converges to a, to a single point, right? assuming that I'm shrinking the diagonal by half or something like that. Okay, it converges. How about what if I take this eraser and I double it? I double its size. Does that converge? An infinite sequence of doublings, would that converge? No, right? So then, <coughs> so then what I'm saying is that if I'm multiplying this thing by something greater than one an infinite number of times, will the result converge? No, it'll diverge. This thing will explode. If I take a number between 0 and 1 and I mul continuously multiply this object by that number, it will shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink and shrink until it converges. Now, what does it mean here? So this thing is called a contraction, right, if you're in this category. This thing is called a dilation, right? Contractions converge under iteration. Dilations diverge under iteration. What about this one? Who can think of what this one would be? <coughs> It's, it's kind of difficult because I've been using real numbers to talk about multiplication, but actually a more apt analogy is a complex number. What does a complex number do? It does two things when you multiply by a complex number. It scales something, but what else does it do? It turns it. It rotates, right? So complex numbers do scalings and rotations. So this thing, this category is called a rotation. So some rotations converge, but not all rotations. Some rotations diverge. So for example, you take the second hand, the second hand of a clock, right? Every second it, it moves from your direction this way, right? Click, 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 click. And then does the second hand converge? Right? No, it just it just goes all the way around, never converges to any particular point, just rotating around the clock. Never converges to anything. Right? So then sometimes if you're in the case of a rotation, it doesn't converge. Now let's say that I have some very weird clock that has the following property where, uh, you know, it starts at 12 and then at one second it goes half the distance back all the way around, right? Click. And then the next second it goes half of the remaining distance. Click. And then the next second half of the remaining distance. Click. And then half the remaining distance. Click. Right? It keeps doing this all the time. Does that converge? Yeah, it converges to straight up, 12. So that's a kind of rotation that converges. Right? So some rotations converge and some rotations diverge. Okay, so that's the geometric intuition behind these things. Okay, so any questions before we do an example? Any question? Okay, this looks... These are all so boring. Look at this. <coughs> Okay, so for example, the sum from n is 1 to infinity of e to the 5n over n to the n. Okay, so then now, two comments as far as test taking strategies are concerned. Okay, so then if you see n to the n, okay, that's a good indication that you should try the root test. Okay, but there is a there is a legitimate and very important exception to this, and that is unless n factorial is also present. <laughs> and then you should use the root test. Oh, uh, the ratio test. <laughs> yeah. So then you use the ratio test. So if you see if you see n to the n, you can almost certain you can be very certain that you're going to use the ratio test or the root test. Okay, if n factorial is there, you got to use the ratio test, and the, and the basic reason is just due to the definition of the factorial. You want to use the ratio test to cancel out the factorial part, right? Just like what happened in in the previous example. So as for this, <coughs> as for this, right? You could, you could say, okay, before I actually do a computation, I just want to try and give you an idea of what's going to happen. Right? If you play with the exponents, 
if you play with the exponents and algebraically modify it, then you get something like this. e to the 5 over n to the n. Right, if you just mess with the exponents. <coughs> now, if this was a constant, if it was like uh, a to the n, no, let's say r, because that's what we were using previously. If this was r to the n, then what kind of series would this be? A geometric series. It would be a geometric series. And we know that, that well, this is positive, so as long as it's less than 1, right, it's going to converge if it's going to be like a geometric series. So how about this? Is this less than 1? This part, is it going to be less than 1? And the answer is eventually, right? If I made this like e to the million, right, for billions and trillions and probably a lot more terms than that, they would all be greater than 1. But eventually, eventually this is going to be less than 1. So what do you think? Is this going to converge or diverge? It's going to converge. So let's see what the root test has to say. Okay, you should, we're we need to announce our intent to the greater, so root test. <coughs> and we'll use a n is e to the 5 over n to the n. Okay, <coughs> so then the limit as n goes to infinity of the absolute value of e to the of like this e to the 5 over n to the n n absolute value 1 over n. Okay, so then I can drop the absolute value because because all of those terms are positive, then I have the exponent n multiplied by one, uh, n to the 1 over n like this. So then how do you algebraically combine iterated exponents with multiplication? So this is equal to the limit as n goes to infinity. The limit as n goes to infinity of just e to the 5 over n. Okay, and what is this limit? Zero. The limit is zero. <coughs> okay, so then what is the conclusion? It converges, but more than converges, converges absolutely by the root test. Okay, so now I'd like to point something out, right? So the very first example that we did, we compared a G, we said, okay, how about the series of 2 to the n over n factorial, right? And I said, well, if this is going to converge, then it depends on how fast these two things grow with respect to each other, right? If the geometric series grows faster than the factorial, if the geometric thing grows faster than the factorial thing, then it's going to have to diverge. If the factorial thing grows fast enough, then it's going to converge, okay? And what do we determine? The factorial, using the ratio test, Right, we got a zero, which means that the factorial doesn't doesn't grow a little bit faster than two to the n. It grows incredibly faster than two to the n, in a sense, infinitely faster than two to the n. Okay, so factorial grows really really quickly. Okay, then we did this question. Right, another another geometric thing in a numerator. Right, e to the five n. That's geometric. Right, it's geometric. And then we have this n to the n. And so in this question, it's essentially, you know, what do we determine? We determine it converges. So what does that tell you about n to the n? It, n to the n's growth versus e to the 5n. n to the n grows a lot faster than e to the 5n. So much faster that you, you can't even, like, give it a ratio. It's like, it's infinitely faster. That's how much faster it grows. So now we have these two things, right? We have n to the factor we have n factorial and n to the n. And they both apparently grow infinitely faster than geometric things. So how do they grow compared to each other? Right? Because they both grow pretty fast. How fast do they grow with respect to each other? I don't know. Maybe you should look into that <coughs> in your own time. <coughs> so, specifically, I would encourage you to solve this problem. Right, this sum... Um, from n is 1 to infinity of something like this, n factorial over n to the n. See if it converges or not. <coughs> okay, so then, if, if n factorial 
if n factorial is the winner, right, if it's faster, then this won't converge. If n to the n is the winner and it grows fast enough, then this, this might converge. Okay, so this, the answer to this question will kind of tell you how fast do these things grow with respect to each other. Okay, so then finally, what, what test would you have to use? The ratio test. Why the ratio test? I see n to the n. n to the n tells me that the root test might be good. Ah, but it has factorial in it, so that, that takes you back into the, oh, okay, I should, use the, I should use the root test, or the ratio test, I mean. <coughs> okay, great. So any question about this one? I'm not going to solve it. Yes? Yes, it would be n plus 1 to the n plus 1. And the, the, the computation becomes interesting to carry it out. Okay, so any question about anything before move on to something else? Oh, incidentally, the root, right, I showed you that the ratio test can make no, pr can make no predictions to about p-series. And also, that mostly extends in sort of a loose way that since the, root, the ratio test can't make, make any conclusion about a p-series, nor can it make any conclusion about a series which can be compared to a p-series. Okay, so anything like a p-series, the, the ratio test can't do anything. Root test is exactly the same. The root test cannot make a determination about p-series or anything which could be successfully compared to a p-series. So, you should keep that in mind because you know, you have to, you're going to have to manage your time and responses on the, on the questions. Yes? You could try it. Like you might say, you might say something like this, right? What, so, this, so I'm not talking about this question anymore, right? So then here's two things, right? The sum from n is 1 to infinity of 1 over n factorial. You might wonder, does this converge? And the answer is yes, this converges very quickly. Okay, but, <coughs> you know, you might, you, I think your question is, could you compare it to this one, 1 over n to the n? 1 over n to the n, like that. And the answer is, I don't really see how you could sex successfully do it. Right? So if you saw, first off, I would never give either one of these. But if I did give this one, you should use the ratio test. Because what the ratio test is, is it's, it is a comparison of a series with itself. Right? It's still comparing a series, but you're comparing it to itself. Okay, and you're asking about the ratio of successive terms. And if the ratio of successive terms converges in absolute value and it's between 0 and 1, then you can say, okay, I compared this series to itself and then to a geometric series. So comparing this series to itself, it behaves less than that geometric series or more than that geometric series, and therefore it converges or diverges as appropriate. Okay, so here for, for this one, it is the exact same story, except algebraically it's more convenient to use the root test than the ratio test. Can you say, though, that because n to n converges, then n factorial converges because factorial is always less than n to n? Ah, but you don't know that. Okay. So, so because, you don't, because you don't know that, that's not enough, right? So then, you know, right, this is a fact, right, that n factorial is less than n to the n. Right, eventually. But this is not something that you know. Or you'd have to demonstrate it. Okay. Which would be, which would be this, <laughs> for this question that I gave you, it'd be, it, would, it would be easier to solve this question than to show this directly. <laughs> okay, and in, in showing this, you would essentially be solving the question anyhow. Okay, for those of you that are actually interested in this, <coughs> this is related to something called Stirling's formula. Sterling's formula or estimate. Is a historical a, a point in history where this was being considered. <coughs> a guy named Sterling. I'm not sure if it's the same Sterling that Sterling engines are named after. I think it is. Okay, so any questions before we move on? So I have good news. The good news is that's all of the tests that we're going to learn. That's it. That's all of them. But now we're going to start applying them in different situations. <laughs> okay, so then now, before we get any further, 
I want to tell you the context that we're in. So then, someone tell me what a sequence is. That's right. It's a list of numbers, and this list has infinitely many elements in it. Okay. Now, given a sequence, what is a series? Right. The attempt to sum them up. Right. A, a sequence is just a list of infinitely many numbers. A series is the attempt to add them all up. Okay. So then, if you're going to take infinitely many things and try and combine them, you know then maybe this, this process makes sense and maybe it doesn't, right? That's what math is about. So then now what we're about to do is we're about to say, okay, so we've been talking about um, sequences of numbers and series of numbers, okay, which is to say we're going to take an infinite collection of <coughs> numbers and then try and add them all up and see if that makes any sense, okay? And we have various tests where you can say, oh, that series looks like that, I'll use that test, or like that, I'll use that test, or whatever. So now we're going to change slightly, and now we're not going to consider sequences of numbers anymore. We're going to consider sequences of functions. Okay, so then a sequence of functions, and then we're going to wonder, well, what happens if I try and add together these infinitely many functions? Do I get a function? And the answer is sometimes, right? The answer is always sometimes. <laughs> so because this is the first introduction that we're, we're getting to this, right, because this is the first exposure you have to this, we're going to consider the simplest possible kind of function, okay, and that is polynomials, okay? So we're going to say, okay, here's a sequence of polynomials, okay, and then I'm going to try and add them all up. Can you add them up? Okay, and the answer is going to be sometimes, but there, there's going to be all kinds of, of <coughs> areas of gray of when this is going to happen uh, and how it's going to happen. So, for example, if you take an infinite list of polynomials and you add them together, okay, the result is essentially never a polynomial. It's not a polynomial anymore. Right? But that's kind of strange because if you take two polynomials or any finite number of polynomials, 40 million polynomials, and you add them all together, then it is another polynomial. It's always another polynomial. But if you take infinitely many polynomials and add them together, it might not be a polynomial anymore. might still be a function, but, but probably not a polynomial. Okay, so does everybody see sort of the direction we're going? We've been talking about numbers, right? Infinite lists of numbers, trying to add them all up. Do you get a number? Sometimes. Okay, now we're going to talk about functions. Infinite lists of functions, try and add them all up. Do you get another function? What kind of function do you get? In what sense is it a function? Blah, blah. So that's where we are. So does everybody see where we are? Okay, good. I just want you to keep that in context. Okay, so now we're in section 9.7, <coughs> which is called Taylor polynomials. And approximations. Okay, so I'm going to, in order to broach the topic, I'm going to say find the equation of the tangent line to y is, I'll say it like this, to f of x is e to the x at x equals 0. Okay, so this is a calculus one question. <coughs> Okay, so I'm just going to do it quite rapidly because I want to say some other things before we break for the day. And that is, okay, find the equation of the tangent line. <coughs> so, I need to find the slope, so I'll do that. The derivative of e to the x, conveniently, is e to the x. So the slope of the, of the tangent line is m evaluated at the derivative m is the derivative evaluated at 0, which is what in this question? 1. Okay, so then <coughs> the point that is on the line is what you get when you plug in 0. So you get y is equal to f of 0, which is also 1. So the point which is on the line is 0, 1. So we can use the point-slope form of a line 
the point is 0, 1, the slope of the line is 1. <coughs> so the equation is y minus 1 is equal to 1 multiplied by x minus 0. After simplifying, this is y is equal to x plus 1. Okay, so this none of this should be uh, surprising to you at all. <coughs> So now, this uh, exponential looks something like so. Right, that's sort of what e to the x looks like. Then here at this point, the red point I indicated, as I said, find the equation of the tangent at that point. <coughs> okay, so then it sort of looks like this. Okay, so that's the tangent line. So now I'd like to point something out about the tangent line. The tangent line has two properties that are very important. First off, it's attached to the function there, right? They share that common point. Right? The tangent line isn't somewhere over here, it's not up there, right? They're attached. Okay, now, so in that sense, the graph and the tangent, they agree about the point. They agree right here. What else do they agree about? Right, why is the tangent line like this and not like that? The slope, right? They have the same slope. Right, so the tangent line and the graph, they agree about two things. They agree about the point, Okay, and they agree about the slope. Okay, so then now I'm going to write something weird, <coughs> something that you may think is weird, and that is that, okay, well this, right, considering the slope, what we were doing is we were doing this, f of 1. So what, is this, what does this notation mean, f superscript 1 in parentheses? <coughs> So this is a notation that should have been introduced to you in 2417. What does that mean when you do superscript 1 like this? The first derivative. The first derivative. And, right, this, how do you denote the original function? The superscript is what? 0. So this is the 0th derivative. Right, the 0th derivative. So what I'm saying here is that, is that the graph and the tangent line they agree with the zeroth derivative and the first derivative. That's how they agree. Okay, so now what we're about to say is, why stop at one? Right? Why not make, why not come up with something that agrees with the zeroth derivative, the first derivative, and the second derivative? Why stop at two? Why stop anywhere, right? So we could come up with a polynomial that agrees, right, because this, right, the equation of a line is a polynomial, Okay, we can come up with a polynomial that agrees with this function arbitrarily well, right? It agrees with the first, second, third, fourth, fifth derivatives. Okay, so it agrees all the way up, up to the top. So then this, right, this is called a tangent line. Tangent line. But the word tangent for mathematics in English is, uh, when it's conducted in English, is always reserved, almost always reserved for when the agreement is up to the first derivative. When you start going on, when you want to say, uh, you know, we agree that the tangent object agrees with the graph object up to the fifth derivative or something like that, then it's no longer called tangent, it's called osculating. So this is called an osculating line, okay? But we could come up with an osculating parabola, we could come up with an osculating cubic, an osculating quartic, an osculating quintic. Incidentally, what does osculating mean? It means... Kissing, right, kissing. That's the kissing line. And of course, we would never say that in English culture. That's far too, uh, I don't know, over the top, whatever. So, <coughs> so this is what we're doing now, is we're going to find polynomials, okay, that agree with the graph up to higher order derivatives, okay? Zero, first, second, third, fourth, fifth, arbitrarily high. So does everybody understand the general idea? Okay, 
So let's do that. <coughs> so let's do that. Find a polynomial. Uh, such that p evaluated at 0, the, the 0th derivative evaluated at 0 is equal to f evaluated at 0, and <coughs> p1 evaluated at 0 is equal to f1 evaluated at 0, and p2 evaluated at 0 is equal to f2 evaluated at 0, and for good measure we'll go one more, p3 evaluated at 0 <coughs> is f3 evaluated at 0. And so this, right, this one on the left is a polynomial, and this one on the right is going to be the exponential function. Okay. <coughs> okay. So then, generally speaking, right, the polynomial that we're looking for has to take this form. So I'm going to write it as follows. It will be a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed. And then blah, blah, blah. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So, in a sense, what we need to do is we need to find a1 to a3. We need to figure out what their values are. <coughs> okay, so as for the first equation, as for the first equation, p0 evaluated at 0 has to be f0 evaluated at 0. Okay, so we need to solve this one. We need to solve this one. <coughs> so then, the 0th derivative of the exponential is the exponential. It's e to the x. And the 0th derivative evaluated at 0 <coughs> is what? So what do you get if you plug in 0? You get 1. Okay. <coughs> so then p evaluated at uh, the 0th derivative of p evaluated at 0 is what? So then here's p. Right, so let's back up just a little bit, right? So so that we get the pattern. So this will be a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus a3x cubed. So what do you get? if you evaluate the 0th derivative at 0. You get a0. Right? If you plug in 0 for x into here, you get a0. So what does that tell you about the value of a0? This tells you that a0 is equal to 1. Okay. So then now let's do the second equation. <coughs> that the first derivatives have to be equal. Okay, so then the first derivative of the exponential is the exponential, and the first derivative evaluated at 0 is 1. <coughs> so the first derivative of the polynomial is what? So then what's the derivative of a0? 0, zero because a0 is a constant. Okay, so then it will be a1 plus 2a2 plus 3a3, uh, so this should be 2a2 multiplied by x, plus 3a3 multiplied by x squared. So then what is the first derivative evaluated at 0? <coughs> a1. So what does this tell you about a1? It's equal to 1. Okay, so since we're running out of time for this particular question, I'll go ahead and tell you that on this particular question, but only on this question, this is not generally true, you will discover the following. 
that A0 is equal to A1 is equal to A2 is equal to A3, and they are all equal to 1. So then the polynomial, the polynomial that agrees, <coughs> oh, they're not all equal to 1. What am I saying? So A0, <laughs> so A0 is 1, A1 is 1, A2 is 2, and A3 is 6. <coughs> is 6. Is that what I'm trying to say? No, this can't be right either. So this should be 1 over 2, and this should be 1 over 6. So then it will be 1 plus x plus x squared over 2 plus x cubed over 6. So this polynomial, <coughs> this polynomial agrees with the exponential function up to three derivatives. Right? Three derivatives. Okay, see you on Thursday. <coughs>